Hi, my name is Chris O'Hara, and I'm a writer for an independent comic book publisher named Bent Box Comics. You can find our social media anywhere, the Twitter, Instagram, all under Bent Box Comics. Currently have a Kickstarter out for our first comic book series named Artificial Number One. So please go check that out and back it if you can. And you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. Of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined by another talented and creative individual in the entertainment industry. He is a comic creator of a new comic that I have just noticed here today. He's been on other amazing shows as well, too, like Keeping It Geekly and a few others that I know of. So, you know, check out those interviews as well, too, while we're sharing. Joined today by the ever-talented Chris O'Hara, creator of... Artificial, how are you doing today? Good, Kurt, how are you? So for those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. My name is Chris O'Hara. I'm a uh, independent comic book writer for a publisher that I kind of founded called Bent Box Comics. I've had a long love of comics and everything entertainment based ever since I was a kid. Something that I mentioned to Keeping It Geekly, so like some of this, some of this might be rehashing if you've, if you've uh, watched anything else I've been on. But my, my father was a inker for Marvel Comics, might have heard of him, uh, a long, long time ago. I don't think I said this on his podcast, though, but the reason why he's no longer inking with them is he gave them a kind of like a, a prototype, a little thing that he wrote and drew for a comic series that he really was interested in, some like sci-fi thing. And they said it needs work. And then he quit. <laughs> That's not the way to handle it, if anyone wants to know, because... Uh, because that, that was a missed opportunity. Uh, we've had comics in the house ever since I was a little kid. A whole walk-in closet full of them. Boxes upon boxes upon boxes. We went through like one of those big books of like how how much is your collection worth? And he had some in there that were like $50,000, $75,000. It was nuts. All in pristine condition. So he's been a collector ever since he was a kid. But then when he left, he left when I was 10. I kind of fell out of comics and kind of anything you had to do with him whether subconsciously or not i'm not really sure then when i got older you know i'm 33 now a couple years ago i got back into it so now i'm back into comics and i uh decided to try and write one and so i've written my first comic artificial what's artificial all about then because from what i've seen i i love it i just think it's incredible the art style of the writing i'm gonna be a backer for sure good 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 artificial is about three traditional artist, and in the description I call them an unlikely trio. An unlikely trio gets pulled from the past to fight against our soulless AI overlords. <laughs> so the premise came about when I was seeing the rise of AI art, mid journey, there's all these different things, chat GPT, which is a writing software now. <sighs> They're incredible, I'm not gonna lie. I'm not in any way like railing against them. I mean, it's just the natural progression of technology. It's just where we're gonna be. But as I'm seeing it and just seeing like people just, hey, I made it, I made some art. It's like, yeah, you didn't though, technically, <laughs> you know, to just to be honest. Sorry, yeah, I came up with an idea of like, what would it be like if humanity kind of lost their creativity? So we fast forward hundreds of years and we are enslaved by the AI. We have AI overlords that are and, and taking over everything, every aspect of our lives. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try not to give you a lot of spoilers, but an unknown entity uh, is able to bring from the past three traditional artists. The main protagonist is Vincent Van Gogh, which I'm sure you're familiar with. The second, there's two ancillary protagonists, kind of like, what would you call it? Sidekicks? Like sidekicks, yeah. There's two like sidekicks with them. Uh, one is Marika Sat. She is a contemporary of Vincent Van Gogh, lived similar time, technically outlived him. And then Leonardo da Vinci. Those are the three main characters. They call from the past. They fight against AI. I kind of took some inspiration from Sam Raimi and Army of Darkness, nice. that style. I'm, I'm also kind of trying to hit that humor button too that he has where it's a lot of action. You know, it's sci-fi action comedy. That's kind of what I'm going for. So it's not quite horror action comedy that his would be. I kind of replaced horror with sci-fi. My heart's with horrors too though. So I'm, I have a couple plans for, for some good moments in it, but I'm trying to sprinkle some humor in there and, and just have it be a fun, fun story. What's the most misunderstood aspect about the comic industry that maybe people that aren't in it don't understand? That's a good question. Well, I would say that's a good question. Give me a second to think about yeah, it. Take your time. The one thing I noticed about the comic industry is point of entry is kind of lower. Uh, and that's something that not a lot of people really think about. Like I've done a lot of other creative ventures. I've done uh, independent video games. I've done screenwriting. I've done uh, for like TV and stuff like that. The point of entry for comics is significantly lower. I mean, you can make the art yourself. Obviously there are people who write, draw, every, they do everything. But it really is just, if you have the desire 
and and the will you can make a comic book and and it's and it's awesome and as long as it's engaging and the stories you know it, it reaches enough people or it finds its audience you can do it that's the one thing i love about comics is that the point of barriers for video games and everything it's so extensive and and it's difficult to get something done and the amount of people you need to really make those things happen is significantly higher than a comic so like if you have a story if you have uh, an idea that you really want to share with people i loved uh, narrative based video games that was kind of where my heart was if i had a story to tell i wanted to do it interactive media that way I could have the player, you know, like have a player go through and I can lead them and they can make their own choices and stuff like that, which which is my favorite form of uh, storytelling. I'm, I'm a huge gamer, but the ability to actually get a story out there and have someone enjoy it is easier with a comic. So like, it's difficult to make one. I'm not saying it's easy by any means of uh, any stretch of the imagination, but you can do it. That's one thing that I found that's really cool about the comic book industry is you can make it happen. You can find an audience. It's really neat. You know, it's always amazing to have a, a team of people around you. A lot of creators are solo artists and writers. Besides yourself as an amazing writer, who else is working with you on Artificial? Yeah, I'm a two-man team. I'm writing. And then I have a uh, artist named uh, Gabriel Fonseca. He's from Brazil. I found him on Behance. And I was just kind of looking around and I was looking primarily at individuals and their concept art and things that they've worked on. And I was also looking for people with not a lot of followers. So I was looking kind of for the, for lack of a better term, bottom of the barrel people. I literally like just went to zero followers. Let me look through all these people. because so I wanted to find someone who hasn't really done much yet. Their art style wasn't like out there. That way it was comparable or, you know, super comparable. I found him and I reached out to him and he was super excited for it. And so we started collabing and, and working on it together. And he is insanely talented he did all the art ink and coloring and lettering and that was kind of at my request at every stage because i know a lot of people they do one inker one colorer one letterer as we're going through he did the inking and i was like man it looks great and i've seen his coloring before so i said would you be willing to color it too and he goes yeah 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 i can do that i was like i know you can i was like i've seen it you can do it and i was like let's do it did the coloring it's phenomenal i love it and then i said i was like i mean you could probably do lettering, right? And he goes, yeah, I think I can. And I was like, you might as well. I was like, I kind of want you to use this as just experience. Like get your feet wet. You have done everything. You've completed a comic on your own and one man team. And uh, I've said this before. I said it on Keeping It Geekly, but I said, he's my artist. You're not allowed to touch him. He's my, I have, I do not have a binding contract, but I'm, I'm writing one up right now. He's only allowed to work with me. I'm very covetous of him. He's, he's fantastic. One really cool thing was he, there, we had a moment where he, he went from, uh, you know, do you like it? How is it? Is it good? You know, those kind of questions, which, which is reasonable and, and something I would do if I was creating something for someone. He went from that where I told him, I was like, bro, you're killing it. Everything is fantastic. Your art style is amazing. Everything's clean. The coloring is beautiful. He slowly started developing more of a of a confidence in himself, which was awesome because he was, he was very shy in the beginning. And then as we've worked through it, he's now, he's like, man, I killed this one. Like that was his message on like one of the pages. And it was just so cool just to see him like go from, do you like it to, I did it. Like, this is really cool. And then at the very end, when we finally finished it, inking, lettering, everything, we're like kind of just going over it. We're like, hey man, we're done. We did it. And he, you know, I don't think he'll mind me sharing this, but he got emotional. He was like, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm really emotional right now. He's like, I didn't think I would ever you know, make a comic and finish it. It was, it was cool. Nice. But, but yeah, he, he's fantastic. I really love him. And then something else is that he has such a comic centered brain to where this being my first time making a comic and him, I mean, we kind of both have a love for comics that went, that goes back very deep. He helped make this comic better in every single way, not just art story. We would go over, I was like, Hey, I wrote this. I wrote this dialogue. I, this is the scene here. I tried to give him so much creative freedom. I said, I have panels one through five lately listed. I was like, you want to throw in a six panel? You want to throw in a two in between one and two and then just shift them all? And I was like, if, if you want to mess with my narrative visually, go for it because I trust you to make it better. There's many pages that are head over heels better than what I wrote all because he took the initiative and changed it. So yeah, he's fantastic. Currently you have a Kickstarter ongoing, you know, so congratulations on that. Usually they say Kickstarters are like a second or third job, depending on what you're doing yeah. in your life. Promotion is the key for this. So thank you for coming on. I do appreciate you uh, promoting your, your, your comic on my show. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of this Kickstarter campaign, how are you trying to promote it? And what are some of your tiers that you're really trying to showcase to those that are looking at your first foray into comics? I'm trying to 
promote it as much as I can on, on all social media. So Twitter, Instagram, even Facebook, all the grandmas on Facebook really love it. <laughs> but primarily Twitter and Instagram, it's, it is kind of difficult to get a lot of engagement recently, which is difficult. But that's why I'm kind of going on all these shows. I, I really want to try and spread the word and I really want to give it the best chance of at being funded and making it happen. Obviously, I, I really appreciate you having me on. And, and this is one way of marketing it. If you want, I can always share the Kickstarter right now. We can go through some of it if sure. anyone's interested. This is the Kickstarter campaign. So this is the Kickstarter. Here are some of the like kind of banners I created for it to kind of get a feel of some of the in, uh, interior art of the comic. 32 page sci-fi action comedy. You know, what happens when humanity loses its creativity? So that's kind of uh, the point. Now, the first issue is primarily about Vincent Van Gogh. He's at the end of his rope. I don't know if how many people are familiar with Vincent Van Gogh and how he died, but he killed himself. Everyone knows he's extremely depressed. He wasn't really finding much of an, any audience for the most part, and that really it killed him, basically. He, he just couldn't take it. So I've done a lot of research on Vincent Van Gogh, and I've always loved him, but it's been fun to kind of like, okay, I want him to be the main character, so now I need to really dive into him to make it as realistic as possible, or at least as true to him as possible. So that's kind of where this takes place, is kind of the, the end of, of the line for him. But his will to live is quickly and brutally tested. So that's kind of midway through the comics. That's where we hopefully see a character arc for Vincent Van Gogh that's obviously not remotely near historically accurate, but uh, it's going to be fun. So we got Vincent Van Gogh. Now here are some of the descriptions for him. We got Marie Cassatt and Leonardo da Vinci. <laughs> My favorite thing about Leonardo da Vinci is I kind of wrote him as like the crazy uncle of the group. <laughs> so he's just going to be, one thing you'll notice is he doesn't speak English. He only speaks Italian. I have plans to keep that a running joke. I don't know if you'll ever know what he's saying, unless you know Italian. And neither do, and Marie Cassatt and Vincent Van Gogh do not know Italian in real life. They've never learned Italian. So that is, I have some fun interactions between them. And I'm really having fun writing that. Some of the covers are really cool. I have a wraparound cover Ooh. by the interior artist. So this is the front. I am keeping the back a secret. Mm -hmm. I really love it. This has turned out really well. And then I have a, Propaganda covers. We have three different versions. We have the standard version, which is color. Mm -hmm. The propaganda version is is what I'm calling it because it's not a true black and white. If you're familiar with like Sin City, yep. like that black and white with that a splash style, of color. Yeah, yeah. That's what I was going for with it. So we have the propaganda edition, which this is the cover for that. Everything's in black and white with little splashes of color where we choose. This right here was AI generated. <laughs> It's kind of a cheeky cover. This was a marketing cover when we were first starting writing the comic book. I was like, it'd be funny to have like an art gallery with like a binary code and just a picture of Vincent Van Gogh that AI drew, <laughs> but just as awful. And I didn't say awfully drawn Vincent Van Gogh. I put draw Vincent Van Gogh and this is what it gave me. <laughs> so I was like, perfect. So it's kind of like a cheeky cover. That's the only use of AI art that will be in my comic, I promise. And then this, I have kept a secret. Oh, wow. This is the Starry Nightmare edition. If anyone's familiar with Vince Van Gogh, they'll know the Starry Night. I had a, a Portuguese artist. He's world renowned. He's on Instagram. I would highly recommend following him right here. I had him create a scene that's in the comic that has not been shown yet of the world in the state of AI overtaking. So the future. He's incredible with capturing the art style of Vincent Van Gogh. Yeah. So I said it'd be really neat to have Vincent Van Gogh paint this page and this is a a artist's interpretation for sure he took a lot of liberties the the artist mm -hmm. but i just love how it turned out yeah, that's um, incredible. so this is a special edition cover that you can get this will be a cover the interior will be the same as the colored version it that's, turned out so well that's amazing yeah so so this i'm really excited about so i hope everyone uh, backs this one for sure <laughs> here's a little bit of a preview i'm not gonna i kind of i removed all the text so we have no spoilers Here's just some of the art. Not really going to follow through the narrative too much. If you see it, you see it. This was really fun to do. I had my artists. So obviously, I, I hired an artist to do the true to Vincent Van Gogh style, mm -hmm. right? For that other color cover. And then I had my artist give his take on what Vincent Van Gogh sees when he sees the world. Nice. And so we have a couple scenes in the comic of Vincent Van Gogh seeing the world and trying to give it that starry night feel. And this is his version of it. I, I love it. It turned yeah. out great. Oh, and we were going to have a couple Easter eggs. I don't know if this guy looks familiar to you, but that's me. <laughs> that, that's Paul. Uh, he's a real life person. He he was a caretaker for Vincent Van Gogh and Vincent Van Gogh hated him. <laughs> so I'm, I'm looking forward to being in the comic. I thought it would be fun. Uh, I used to have that style mustache. So that's probably why it doesn't look so much like me, but uh, <laughs> that's what we uh, rendered it after. 
This right here is a scene of Vincent writing a, a letter to his brother, yeah. Theo. This was really fun to write. I read tons of his letters. Yeah. So I actually read all of Vincent Van Gogh's letters to his brothers, to different people. Mm -hmm. That way I could kind of give the feel of how he writes. So this was really fun. This right here is my wife. <laughs> Another little Easter egg. Uh, I love Easter eggs, so they're going to be all over the place. Nice. And then this is kind of the last action scene that you're going to get a taste of. So this is some of the AI that are coming after him. I'm giving him more of a zombie feel. <laughs> But I love it. My artist killed it oh, yeah. with, with some of these scenes. And then real fast, the propaganda. I'm not going to go through all of it. But here's the propaganda version. I have black and white with splashes of color. And I love it. Nice. I think it turned out so well. Oh, that's amazing. The speech bubbles will kind of still be colored. Just little, little bits Thanks. here and there. Yeah. Really like this. It's, I'm just right here. I'm so excited about it. And this is one of those things where we were like, okay, well, obviously we're going to do a black and white version. Let's just do that. It'll take 15 minutes. We just have to desaturate everything. Easy peasy. And then as we're looking at it, we're like, we can really make this good. <laughs> I, was like, I love Sin City. And then that was the first thing my artist said too. He's like, oh yeah. He's like, that would work. And then we're, we're taking time. We're like, all right, let's do it. And it was kind of one of those like bite the bullet things. It was like, if we're going to do it, let's do it good. And he spent a lot of time just isolating colors and making, picking what would pop the best. It's it's fantastic. That's just incredible. And it's not as harsh as the Sin City style either. So it's, right. still, it's still visually appealing, especially in the black and white. That's right. I think that's the true testament of an artist, where if you can see their work in color and black and white and appreciate both, then you know you have a great art. Yeah, and he is. He's fantastic. He's going to be hating me for, for <laughs> puffing him up so much. He said that. He's like, thank you so much. Yeah, I was like, no problem. He's like, you talk too much about me. <laughs> uh, he's just so shy. It's funny. <laughs> Team, I didn't put him in here yet. I have to get his picture in, but this is just a little description of me. <laughs> Add-ons, we have a sticker pack. So this will be a little sticker pack you can get for $5 uh, with all these little individual stickers, <laughs> stickers, the little pieces from the comic that you'll find. We have a poster pack. These are posters that'll be all over the comic that are kind of AI driven. They have special messaging inside of them and stuff. So this will makes sense as well once you read it and then what i'm really excited for is the uh, vincent's sunflower patch so throughout the whole comic he has a little sunflower on on his jacket we're going to make an iron on patch that you can uh, put on anything nice. so that'll be a little one stretch goals i am not revealing that yet until we hit them got a couple cool things in store for those and then the future and that's pretty much it this just goes over i have a plan for a lot of uh, story at least eight issues wow. i'm giving myself a lot of creative freedom take the story and then if i don't have a very harsh roadmap that's how i write i don't like putting very harsh plot points in there yeah so even right now i'm um, just finished issue three and issue three ended up being completely different than what i originally roadmapped because the the team goes on like a hunting mission and to test out their new powers and stuff like that so it's i was like ah that'd be fun and so i wrote it and it, and it turned out great so like that's kind of how i'm writing it i want to kind of flesh it out not box myself in any corners and just have it be a a very filled story i want it to feel well written and the world to be embellished and the the characters to have a lot of of development so that's pretty much it what was an early experience where you learned that language had power Probably high school. My favorite class in high, okay, let me rephrase that. Not my favorite class, but the class that I excelled at the most was English. And it's just because I enjoyed writing. I wrote poems, I wrote short stories, I wrote little movies, I wrote little things like that. And I would share them with everyone. I would share them with my teacher. And she was super supportive, which was great. That's also very important because you, know, you never know. If I had a teacher who was like, this is garbage, <laughs> which it probably, I would guess 50% was, probably more. <laughs> But she was very supportive of, of writing and just allowing me to be creative. And she would give like little feedback hints and things like that to help me improve. That's when I kind of really started to enjoy and see that other people could enjoy my writing, stories that I come up with, things like that. So school is pretty important for me in that regard. It, it kind of helped me shape that part of me. You know, everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most bullshit piece of advice that you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that has stuck with you in your career? Uh, second wisest. That's a good question too. To be completely honest, I haven't, I haven't heard a lot of wise advice. Let me just say that. I, I do think a lot of people have the things that work for them, you know, the things that are tried and true for them and, and they try and share it and I appreciate it, but there's a lot of people out there who take different routes and it works for them. And then other people, it just doesn't work for them as well. So uh, a lot of people, you know, follow your heart, that kind of thing, or just trust what you're doing. I would add to that. I kind of flipped it. I don't really believe in that as much. Yeah, a lot of things need to be tried and true and you need to test them. Some things that I've done in my past that I've like just winged it don't always work out the way you want them to. I would say probably the second wisest thing was just put in the work, put in the work is important. Make sure you're diligent about what you're doing. 
make sure you're passionate about what you're doing. Those things do take you far, but passion isn't isn't everything. That would be the negative aspect of that. But you're like, oh, he's passionate about it, so it, it's going to work. Uh, not always. <laughs> Sometimes, if you're lucky, luck also plays a big part, but putting in the work is very important. So I'd say that that's very wise. Not let yourself fall on the wayside and just coast. If you want to do something, you want to do it right, you're going to have to work for it. Well, now I'm curious, what, what's the podcast about? It's called Sunday Pie Podcast. We, I mean, it's nice. We have like nice cameras and everything. And we have seats and, and nice mics and, and a whole studio and a LED sign and everything. We just talk about stuff. We're childhood friends. So we just talk about new stuff. Video, we react to videos. We just, it's more of a, it's kind of like a comedy podcast. That's cool. But yeah, it's fun. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Yeah. <laughs> so many good questions. I'm going to give an answer that I don't know if many people would, would have thought of. I would say a lot of the reason of, of who I am today is due to my dad. My dad was not in my life very much at all until I was, I mean, he was there until I was 10. We had some fun times, but other than that, he bailed and I haven't really seen him or talked to him too much uh, at all, but it's almost a, a, uh, the result of, of his choices, which I would, I would say were poor choices, uh, kind of helped me see what would be good choices. I'm a husband and a father. I am a passionate person. I'm a hardworking person. I don't quit. I don't give up. Uh, and I think, ironically, the lack of those, of those characteristics in my dad um, made me realize how important they were in myself. So, so seeing that quitting nature in him, and abandonment and start to get heavy. But all these things um, kind of helped me realize I need to be a good husband. I need to be a good father. I need to be a good work, a hard worker, never give up. Um, otherwise you're gonna end up running a Napa auto parts store. So like, sorry to shout him out like that. But anyway, so that's kind of what it is. And so I would say that, that he was probably, he impacted me the most in my, in my direction, oddly enough. From a professional standpoint, you have created a comic book, which not many people can say. You have also been in the game industry as well as uh, a filmmaking as well too. And uh, being a fellow producer, I can understand the, the pain points of, of the film industry as well. For sure. So professionally, you're successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Yeah, I do. Now, success means different things to different people. Uh, uh, this right now, and I, I, I say it in my, you'll see a video when you go to the Kickstarter and back it, which you all will, I'm sure. But when you see the video, I kind of mentioned the fact that this is a passion project. I'm not really like putting all my eggs in this. This is not me saying I am a uh, success due to this Kickstarter. If it doesn't fund, it doesn't fund. I'm a very chill person. I put weight in the important things. So similar to the last question, I'm a su successful father and a successful husband so far. Those things are what's important to me. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a family man, first and foremost. And so in that regard, I feel successful in these additional ventures. They're, they're fun. I really do enjoy them. They allow me to have that creative way of just sharing my mind and how it works, uh, scarily enough. But I enjoy these things, but this isn't where I find my success. So I'll say that. But yes, I do feel like I'm successful. I'm hoping to be successful in this too. <laughs> so that... That that's the only caveat, but uh, but otherwise, yeah. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? You just learn from it. I've failed so much. I fail at everything I do a lot, all the time. <laughs> I've I've failed at being a father. I failed at being a husband many times. I've done the wrong thing, but uh, you just don't you don't uh, you don't give into it. You don't you don't you don't take failures because failures don't necessarily mean you are a failure. We all fail. Everyone fails at something. You do something you fail. That doesn't mean you're a failure. You just failed. It's okay. You try again and then again and again and again and again. That's just how it works. I just don't quit. I guess that would be my big thing. I don't, I don't give up. I don't feel that I'm a failure. I have failed though. Many times. <laughs> the younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's in video, film, comics, whatever the case may be. And the fact that you have the younger generation looking up to you as they are currently, maybe they'll become inspirational creative people in the future. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? I mean, it goes back to putting in the work. 
sharing, not being afraid to put your heart on your sleeve. There's a lot of uh, difficult discord now in, in social media and things like that. And there's trolls and things like that. But a lot of people are good natured. You got to just kind of trust people with you. That's it's a weird, it's a weird sentence and weird sentiment, but it's, it's kind of true. You can just trust people with presenting yourself the way you are. It's important to do that, especially when you create real fast. I'm s- scheduled to go into a local high school. Uh, I have a friend who's a teacher and she teaches art. She wanted to show her students how art history could play some or some importance on what they do or like some way to create or how, uh, you know, it, that it's important. I said, you know, I'm making a comic book about prehistorical figures in the art world. And so I'm actually going to go in there and, and spread the comics and show them and, and kind of give a presentation and stuff. So that's really cool. So along those lines, I'm, I'm looking forward to inspiring people. If your life was a film, video game, or comic book, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? Oh, man. It's good. <laughs> My favorite director... I, I really love Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> and uh, so I'm trying... So I'm, all, I'm like immediately pulled to something that he would have written or something. Let me think. And I also love The Office. So there's so many times where I really want to say how I manage or somehow I manage. That would honestly be very close to my title. It, it would be Stumbling and Fumbling. That would be the title of, of my life. And the soundtrack, uh, you know what? I actually, it, it, it probably wouldn't fit super well. Uh, but I, I love uh, this one guy named Adam Young. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. But yeah, with Owl City. He did a, a whole segment of uh, scores for like movies, but they're fake movies. They're not real movies uh, based on like historical events. I would love to have him score the movie. That'd be fantastic. And then also throw in some like old school rock just for flavor. <laughs> and sprinkle it in there, right? Yeah, just a little bit. Well, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular interview on Two Geeks Talking. Chris, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. It was, all, it was a lot of fun. Thank you. Before I let you go, where can yep. we find you? How can we support you? And of course, where can we find all of your amazing creative work that you do? Obviously, I have, I have a Twitter and Instagram. I was lucky enough to get Bentbox Comics. Mm-hmm. Just straight. That's the handle. So look me up on there. Uh, give us a follow. Give us a share. Obviously, back the Kickstarter if you can. I'd really appreciate it. If you can't, please share it. That would obviously help. Right now, a lot of my creative works are all going to be through this. I'm really enjoying doing comics. I have another series that I'm working on right now uh, called Sundown. It's a psychological horror. It is a 180 from the tone of this current comic, which is nice because I can kind of bounce between and feel refreshed and then write another issue of Artificial. So so it's been fun. Stay on the lookout for all that. Follow us on social media and you'll keep on track. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talk. You need to, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word two, not the number two. On our YouTube, which is a lot more updated than our website, youtube.com forward slash c forward slash tgtmedia. And the podcast is actually back after 12 plus years because that other hosting site deleted everything. So <laughs> good times. Yep. Luckily, I have it as backup. You can find the new podcast at twogeekstalk.podbean.com and of course as I say every week everyone has a story to tell it's up to me to help bring that out thanks for listening watching on Two Geeks Talking